Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we claim the adoption into your family that we know we don't deserve, we know we didn't plan for, we know this world wasn't ready for. This is the kind of stuff that got people calling Jesus blasphemous when he said, in me, God, Yahweh, becomes your dad. And we say yes to this. We don't understand it. We might even feel out of place. Like we don't need, who are we? to be standing in your throne room, to be called inheritors of your kingdom. And yet, because you call us, and because the Spirit allows it, we open our mouths and say yes to you. We pray, Father, that our identity would be wrapped up in your story, that we would, after looking at you, remember who we are, that our inheritance, our future, would be bright, that we could look we could look forward and and see the light at the end of the tunnel and it's not an oncoming train it's hope it's a bright future for standing in your glory in a new resurrected body when that day comes when you bring heaven and it kisses the earth and becomes one and you dwell once again openly with humanity Lord then and only then will we understand what true glory and majesty and worship is supposed to look like Until that day, Father, we thank you for what you've revealed to us. That you desire for us to sing songs to you, to pray before you, to remember your son Jesus at his table. We do these things, Father, through the gift of the Spirit and under under the power and canopy of the name of Jesus. Because you, Father, are worthy and you deserve to be worshipped. This is the day, Father, and you have made it and we hand it right back to you and thank you for it. Be blessed in this space. Be glorified here. And may we have the gift of unity this morning as we feast from your word and receive fully from you. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. You see this? This is what a week at Disney World looks like. I feel like I walked to Mordor through the ring in. So, my family and I came back. I had a delayed flight, got into Dallas about 7 o'clock and drove. Got here 12.30 last night. Alarm went off at 6 o'clock this morning. The shower wasn't quite producing hot water. I'm still shaking a little bit. But I had a great opportunity because as I got the coffee pot going, I went out and started my car. I'm old-fashioned. I still warm up my car. Open the garage first, of course. And I had my coffee, and I went and sat in my car, and I spent a lot of time praying the Lord's Prayer, which has been the topic the past five weeks, and we're going to end today. The prayer Jesus Christ taught And it's safe to assume the prayer that Jesus Christ himself prayed, his rhythm, his pattern. I was in a Sunday school class today. We were talking about prayer life, and somebody said, what's the the best thing to start with? Well, the best thing to start with is what Jesus told you to do. It's always the best thing to do. And and this is saying, I'm saying this to a world and to a, to a, a, a Christian movement in this nation that has become overeducated and under obedient. Just do what Jesus said. Try that on. See what happens. So I sat in my car and started praying the Lord's Prayer categorically. And, and I, I prayed. Uh, I pulled the big H word out. Remember H, hallowed? I, I confessed to God that for an entire week, I slipped. I, I, wasn't, I didn't deny Christ. Uh, I wasn't a, an evil person. I wasn't a jerk. But 
you go to Disney World, that's the land of, it's, the, it's what the, the happiest place, it's the most distracting place on earth. There's, there's consumption all over the place, you're running to the next line, you got fast passes, you got to make the monorail, and I mean, it's just, someone did a pedometer check, we walked eight to ten miles a day, you know, it's just like, oh my gosh. So, I'm sitting in my car this morning and I hallowed God and I first confessed that for a week, Father, I have not been hallowing you. Hallowed just means being the most important thing in my life. You have not been all concerning to me. I've been hallowing other things and I'm asking for one of the greatest miracles and that's where you forgive that instantly and allow me the gift of having you revolve, my life revolve around you. Haven't you ever just like wanted to, to desire God, but you, you just, it's not in you? That's what I prayed this morning. Please, God, put the burn within me, the fire within me, to hallow your name once again. Because if I hallow your name, if you remember, everything else I'm about to pray and we're about to pray becomes clear. If you don't hallow God, everything is skewed. Hallowed be thy name. And then I told God, I'm heading to church in a few moments and I'm really tired. And I've been out for a week. And I pray that your kingdom would come real big. I pray, Father, that your kingdom would come in this church at this little corner of Avenue X and Broadway, pour over into, into Jimmy's and all over the street, be able to come all over the place and get crazy. I pray for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. I want what you want. I desire your kingdom. I desire the reign of the king to take place in my life and in this church. And then I got to daily bread, and this took about 10 minutes. If you remember daily bread, if the purpose of bread is more than just food, it's to provide strength. And so to pray for daily bread is to also say, God, give me enough strength for this day, daily strength. And I prayed in my car for a long time. I am worn out I'm tired. I'm on fumes. If you don't supply me the strength, it's not going to happen today. Give me, Father. And then I ask God to forgive me and to be a forgiving person. If forgiveness is a strength issue, do you don't have forgiveness? It's a weakness issue. God, give me the ability to be a forgiving person today because as you know, each of us will be walking through this day and we will have moments consistently where we'll have to be forgiving, yielding, kind, not graspy. And I ask God to further protect me as we pray in the Lord's Prayer from two things. First, protect me from temptation. So first off, protect me from myself because I'm going to make a mistake today if you don't cut that off. I'm going to go on some rabbit trail. I'm going to say some things during the sermon or in Sunday school or something, and it's going to be bad, and I need God you to protect me from myself. If, God, you can help me with a guy in the mirror, that'll be a miracle. Lead me not into temptation, and number two, and deliver me from evil itself because I'm tired, I'm afraid, I'm scattered. Don't let the evil one use this as an opportunity to pounce. And today we're ending the Lord's Prayer with a threefold proclamation. Three words that are bigger than words. It's to reset the beginning of the prayer, the hallowed part. And the threefold proclamation is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. How long? Forever. If you're Methodist, forever and ever, right? Or Lutheran. Forever and ever. Amen. Now most people, Christians, if you ask them about God's power and kingdom and glory, a few questions, most people will profess, academically or theologically, that they believe that God has unlimited power. Out of heaven and earth and under the earth, God's power is the most important, it's the strongest, it's, it's unlimited, it's forever. Most people will profess that academically. If you ask about God's kingdom, they'll say, oh yeah, God's kingdom is absolute. It's coming, it's like a train, you can't stop it, it's going to come and it will be here forever. You ask somebody about God's glory, and they'll say, oh yeah, if you, had, if you see God right now, the Father, 
your body will hit the floor. You can't handle it. That's, that's, we don't understand glory until we're in the presence of the Father. You, most people have a, a basic understanding of these words, but there's a big difference between having an academic or, or, or just shallow biblical understanding of these words and praying like it and living like it and leaning on God's kingdom and power and glory and living in God's kingdom and power and glory and being born of the Holy Spirit and be tasting God's kingdom and God's power and God's glory. There's a big difference between these 18 inches. It's important. And who taught us his prayer? Jesus did. I got to confess that last line we have for thine is the king. That's not in the Bible. We've added that. The church did. Not me. Like a long time ago. But Jesus preached consistently about the eternal kingdom of God, the glory and the power of God. So it was a safe addition. Wrapped, rounded it all out. So Jesus Christ taught us to pray this prayer. Jesus. And Jesus, for him, these ideas weren't theoretical. When you're talking about God's kingdom, you're talking about where he came from. It's like his home. You're talking about Irving, Texas? I know Irving. I was born there. I was raised there. I was just there. So don't tell me about Irving, Texas. I know all about Irving, Texas. It's, it's not a place on the map. I know where to get the best Mexican food. I know, I know where it is. I know where to avoid driving at the wrong time of, time of night. I know that place. So it's a different thing between having an understanding academically or biblically of something and actually tasting it, experiencing it, hoping for it, leaning on it. And so Jesus Christ, the one who taught us this prayer, was, you know, did not have any qualms about making it clear that in God alone will you find all kingdom, all glory, all power eternally. And it'll knock your socks off. And so to pray that last phrase at the end of categorically praying the Lord's Prayer is to reset your soul, to shout out again, I made a good choice to hallow the Father and not Disney World or some presidential candidate or my job or my relationship or my career. I, I made a good call to hallow God because He alone has what it takes. I don't. You don't. The world doesn't. The Father does. And so it's interesting that we're rounding out this, this part of the series on Palm Sunday. That we're talking about kingdom and crowning and glory and all these things the same day that Jesus came, invaded Jerusalem, and said, it's mine. A great crowd had come for the feast, and they heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches, and they went to meet him, and they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion! You see, your king, he's coming to you. He's seated on a donkey. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. We know these words to be trustworthy and true. So this is Sunday of the High Holy Week of Passover for the Jews when this story takes place. According to Mark, it's at the third hour, which is nine o'clock in the morning. What's interesting is the timing. That same morning, something else was happening. On one side of the city, there was this magnificent gate called the Western Gate of Jerusalem. The whole city was walled, still is. And this Western Gate faced out toward Rome. It had a very nice road leading out of it. Roads were hard to come by back then. And there was an issue that had to be 
taken care of by the Romans every year at this time. And the issue was that the Jews were known as a rebellious people. They didn't do well living under the thumb of an empire. I mean, who would? But they really didn't. And they had a history of having this strange God they called Yahweh interceding on their behalf to deliver them from bondage under empires. Hanukkah is the Jewish celebration after the temple was rededicated when the Jews took it back from the Greeks. They overthrew the Greek influence. It's like all, their, all their holy days are based on rebellion. And here's a week, which is the greatest of weeks in the Jewish calendar, where the holy city of Jerusalem, which is known as the capital of the monarchy of the king of David, swells with population. Several pilgrims come in. The basic understanding of that week, theologically, in the celebration, is remembering when God saved them from Egypt and hardened the hearts of Pharaoh and guided them out of the Red, through the Red Sea and completely shamed Egypt. And so if you were a, a betting man trying to determine when was it likely the Jews would have a revolt, when would we have a problem, it would be on the week of Passover. And so every year, Caesar would send in an enormous dispatch of soldiers to come in to Jerusalem. They would come from the port city of Caesarea, which is named after Caesar. They would march to the gate about 20 miles away. They would enter the city, several men across, and parade through, being led by a man on a chariot. Can you see it? Lining the streets were the Jewish people. They were wearing different faces. Some were, some were impressed, some were angry, but they were all in awe of the military strength of Rome. They could hear the leather crackling as the soldiers marched in. You can hear the, the, the clinking of the, the swords in their sheaths. Up high on big poles were held giant golden eagles, the symbol of Rome. Nine o'clock, Sunday morning. Every year at the beginning of Passover, like clockwork, you could gather and watch the parade come in. But the parade had a message to it. Without a word. But the message was clear. You all can have your little thing and your feast. You can remember fonder times. You can talk your old folk folklores and even go through your religious acts. You can eat, drink, and be merry. But don't you forget whose authority you actually live under. Who actually protects you from outsiders. Don't you forget, in the midst of this celebration of an ancient revolt, that if you try a single thing here, it will cost you everything. We will burn this place to the ground. Forty years after Jesus was ascended, they did. That same morning, on the east side of town, there's another gate. It was a smaller one, and it was almost always open because it faced friendly territory. Outside the gate is this, this small mound, mountain-looking thing covered with olives, olive trees. There was a folklore that said that uh, someone like David, the great king, would come at some point and retake Jerusalem from that gate. That side of town, there was a small event taking place. At the same time. And there was some singing. And they were crying out one primary word, Hosanna, which means save us. It doesn't mean we praise you, it means help us. And people were taking off their clothing 
and they were laying it on the ground and they were cutting pieces of trees and branches and palms from the, from the streets and the, the fields and bringing them in and celebrating and waving and crying. And there was a donkey. And there was a man on a donkey and just using the eyeball test looked like a humble man. The people who were speaking around him had a strange dialect. It was probably from Galilee. They were pilgrims like a lot of people in town that week. Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter, rode in at 9 o'clock in the morning on Sunday of Passover. It wasn't a coincidence. There was a collision that week in that city. And if you look at time, it's interesting how much occurred in one week. In a week's time, this so-called king on a donkey has a private audience with Pontius Pilate. In that conversation, Jesus tells Pilate, I am a king. My kingdom's not of this world. And my kingdom is unstoppable. This king, Jesus, was beaten by Roman soldiers. He was executed on a Roman execution stick, a cross. And three days later, he stood up again. The question is, which parade are you attending? Are you standing at the West Gate with the big crowd? Looking at what the eyeball test, the military might, the strength and the power, the good looks, the money, the gold? Or are you at the Eastern Gate? where a king rides in with a different kind of authority with purpose in every step not much to look at but if you only knew his kingdom and his power and his glory are eternal whereas on the other side of town what looks good where are they today where's Rome where's Egypt Where's Assyria? Where's Babylon? Where's Persia? Today it's the West. It's us. Which parade are you attending? Which parade are you crying Hosanna to? Help me. Save me. Is it to the good looking power that's fleeting? Or is it to Jesus Christ, Son of God, our eternal shepherd? That's a question you need to ask every morning, every trial, every prayer. To whom do I cry? And in whom do I find sanctuary? Do I have a future? Two kings, two emperors entered the same city on the same day at the same time. Only one will remain. Let's pray. Father, in the name of our King Jesus Christ, we pray that we could see the sights, the sounds, the glory of our Lord, your Son and our Shepherd Jesus Christ coming in. We pray, Father, with gratitude that you have revealed this truth to us on this side of the planet, so far away geographically and in terms of time, that you would show us that this Jesus, at his name, every ounce of creation will bend and bow and call out, Jesus is King, Jesus is Lord, and this Father will glorify you. 
We praise you, Father, for the work of Jesus Christ. We've been following behind him as his disciples, but for this week we take a step back and just watch, for we are witnesses to his work that we cannot do ourselves. We're witnesses to his testimony, to his cross, to his glor- glorious resurrection, to his ascension into heaven. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we look to him and we get excited because it's through his work and his work alone that we will find satisfaction and rest and a future and adoption into your family. May we not rush through this week and may we consistently cry Hosanna to the right person, to Jesus Christ through the Spirit's power and unto you, Father. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Invite our elders.